Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring F.B. Mackay Stanton. Uh, right now, British Columbia, originally from Ontario. Thank you for doing this, SB. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me, Chris. I really enjoy being here. Um, so I, I ask all my music guests on the show, what do, where does music come from for you? My beginning in music is actually a very unique one. Um, I have no musical background whatsoever and not really much of a singing background other than, you know, choir when you're a child in church. What actually springboarded my music career was the um, unexpected um, death of my husband in 1993. Uh, we were a young couple and he unexpectedly passed away. And it, it just was so devastating that what I needed was to turn my attention to something completely new and different and focus on that to help me work through my grief. And so I, I decided to take up karaoke singing and I would go out with my friends and we would go sing karaoke. And I was tremendously terrified to get up there and sing, but I found it very healing to be able to express my emotion through music, what I was feeling. And that's how it got started. And, and uh, oh, sorry, continue. Um, and then what happened was after, you know, a month or two of doing that, uh, the bar owner in the club that we used to go to in a very small town in Alexandria, Ontario, asked if she could hire me. And the, the funny story is that I said to her, well, I don't want to be a waitress, you know, and she said, well, I don't want to hire you to be a waitress. And I <laughs> said, well, I don't know how to be a bartender. And she said, I don't want to hire you for a bartender either. And I'm going, well, what do you want to hire me for? And she said, I want to hire you as a singer. I'm going, I don't know how to sing. What are you talking about? And she goes, no, you can sing. And I want to hire you. And it started there. Like she said, all she said to me was learn 10 songs. I will put you in with another artist so that, you know, you guys have like an hour show between the two of you. And it, it started from there and it just kept going and going and going until eventually I realized I could sing. And then I started getting hired from other clubs and I, I ended up having a friend become like a manager and we started you know, doing bigger gigs and it just happened so fast. It was such an unexpected entry into the music industry. <laughs> well, that's how it started. It seems so you, your, your story when I was doing research and I was reading interviews and I was reading your bio, it seems like you went from zero to 60 in a, like no time flat. Like people yeah. all over the world who are trying to get into the music industry would kill to have your career path and that your, uh, your trajectory of uh, the music industry. So is that friend that you were talking about who became your, uh, friend manager, uh, credited yeah. with, uh, becoming that trajectory of getting from zero to 60 so fast, or do you think it was other things as well? Um, well, I think it was both of us because like we were both people with big ideas, right? Like, <laughs> yep. And I'm very entrepreneurial. So between the two of us, his name is Kevin Bradshaw and he was living around the Cornwall, Ontario area, which is very, you know, it's in the same vicinity. And we just met through mutual friends who knew that I was like a, a beginning singer and things were starting to happen. And, he was a marketing person from a newspaper and he was rather interested. So we just met and started to talk. So he helped me actually get uh, the bigger jobs in the beginning through his contacts. So I, I opened up um, as the the opening act for the Canada first, or sorry, July 1st Canada Day celebration in Alexandria, Ontario to big names in that region. Um, it was Wayne Ross' dad, and um, I'm trying to think of the other name of the guy. It's been such a long time. Bobby um, Lalonde. I have to look that up. For you. Bobby Lalonde. That's the name. And uh, and then later that night, I was the headlining act in Cornwall, Ontario, in front of like thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> and it was just such a unexpected, like incredible opportunity. And I'm somebody that just, you know, will go with the opportunities that are open to me. And so I just, I didn't know I could not do it. So I just went and I did it. And, so, and I worked with a business planner to help me understand how to present myself. So it really, 
I was just somebody who, you know, followed the open doors, if you will. At what point of time in this period, when you're going from working from a bar to playing at Cornwall, playing at the candidate celebrations in Alexandria, do you think to yourself, you know what, this could be the career for me. This could be the path that I choose for the rest of my life because I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. And I want to continue doing it. Do you remember that moment? Yeah, I think it was when I stood on the stage in Cornwall, Ontario, in front of a sea of people. It was it was terrifying and exhilarating at the same time, <laughs> but it felt um, like this was something that I should consider seriously. And it was, you know, it, I don't know why that was the moment, um, but it was just a connection. It, there was like an electricity that went through the crowd, and it and I felt like what I was, you know singing and emoting and, and, you know, my connection going out to them and them to me, it just seemed like this surreal moment that kind of changed my life. Like I had been thinking about it seriously up until that point, but then it became a very serious, yes, I'm doing this at that point. That was kind of the turning point. You, your career has, like we talked about so far, started in 1993 in a bar Looking mm-hmm. back on your career so far, like, can you imagine that 1993 year old SB getting up on that stage of sing karaoke to be where she is right now and impacting uh, people across Canada, across the world with their music? Not really. <laughs> like I, I, I was a really super shy person who did not want to be the center of attention ever prior to my husband's death. Like I would avoid it like the plague. So if someone would have said to me, do you think you'll ever be somebody who has, you know, music going around the globe and it being loved? I would go, no, that that's not possible. (laughs) But life can change and things can change and we as people can change with it. So I guess that was the thing. I never anticipated that I could change that much. You you've just openly admitted that you did not like to be the center of attention for someone who does not like to be the center of attention. You then decide, you know what? I want to be on TV. I want to be a TV host on TV and you become it. So (laughs) take me through the process of someone who is so scared. So doesn't want to be part of the center of attention to, you know what? I want cameras looking at me 24 seven, almost. (laughs) Well, it's a very funny story because how this happened was um, there's a lot of small events that lead up to a big event. So like I I kept doing bars and fairs and festivals and things. And then I heard on the radio one time that there was this, it was a a Southern Ontario um, contest, singing contest. It was like a very large region. Um, And all you had to do was send in you know, like a couple songs that you recorded and they could be cover songs, which in my case, that's what I was using at the time. And uh, so I went to a studio in Cornwall and I recorded two cover songs with Roy Nickel, who is now the drummer for April Wine. Back then he was just doing like uh, cover bands. And I think he was in Sam Hill, which is, I believe, a cover band for like the band Journey back in the day. Anyway, so I went, I did that. I submitted my music. And uh, somebody heard on the radio that I had been picked as one of the top nine vocalists for this competition. I'm like, really? (laughs) I was totally stunned. But, you know, I was, as I said, I was just somebody who would just throw things out there and see what happens. And so this door opened to me and then it brought me to Ottawa. And um, I got in with Lorianne Entertainment and um, Ron Sparling, who is, a big name in the entertainment industry in that Ottawa region. And basically I got to tour with the Roland Thunder Band um, through this process and you go to different venues and it's sponsored and it's all about this particular competition that's going on. And then we were supposed to sing at Wayne Rostad's um, clog, but that particular year the clog had been canceled because of insurance reasons. But the clog was the biggest country music festival in Canada. So it would have been a huge deal for all of us to be the, you know, highlighted on that show. So what they did instead was they took us to the Country Music Hall of Fame and induction ceremonies and put us on the TV show. And it was there that I met. Yeah, it was just a turn of, you know, a twist of fate. And so 
uh, we got to go on that show and I met Ronnie Prophet, who he thought he knew me actually. It's a really funny story. I was in the green room in a long gown, all dolled up, and he goes and he jumps on me, literally. Hi, how are you? Husband kisses, and I'm standing there going, Oh my goodness, he thinks he knows me. <laughs> and then he realized and then he realized I was a complete stranger and he went, Oh my god, he said, You look like a star. He said, You have star power. He said, Who are you? You know, and then he started talking to me about my star quality. And I was just so stunned by the whole thing. I was just like, oh, thanks, I think. <laughs> like it was, it was just so unexpected. And then I went on and I performed on the show. And in that audience, the TV show audience was a producer who saw me uh, perform on stage. And it was televised. And he saw the star quality, too. And wow. so, I mean, I don't think that he, you know, at first knew what my name was. So the story goes that from that experience, I, you know, a lot of opportunities opened up, but the one that led to the TV show was my producer, Ron Hanfield. He was from Hawkesbury, Kojiko TV station. He saw me and said to whoever it was, go find that girl. Who is that girl? She's a star. And so they, by this time I had moved to Montreal to pursue my music at a higher level. And so they hunted me down. <laughs> basically in Montreal and said, do you want to be the host of this TV show? And I'm going, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> and I knew nothing like totally. I went in there as a total, no, nothing, you know, like wet behind the ears person. And they knew it. And I just said, just show me what to do. And they did. Wow. So, and I was just, because I was such an open mind, you know what I mean? Like my, I was willing to try anything. My mind was open. I'm very creative. And I got to work behind the scenes in production too, that it was just such a fun thing that even though I was terrified in front of the camera, everything else was so much fun, right? I just couldn't not do it. I had to do it. <laughs> so that's how I came to having my own TV show. So and I was you... actually re Go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, and I was actually replacing Tracy Brown, who is from like the family Brown. And I think that there was somebody else that was, you know, so they had asked to do the hosting. And for whatever reason, they couldn't do it, probably for personal reasons or scheduling reasons. So it had been offered to Tracy Brown of the family Brown, who is very well known in Ontario. They had their own TV show and everything back in the day. So it was a real honor. I mean, it was just so much fun. And um, even though I was always terrified in front of the camera, you know, once I got singing, I was fine. Did you learn something about just, yourself during that time? When, um, when you were I doing the show? That, yeah. I mean, I think that I realized I had more talents than I recognized I had, right? Like hidden things. Because I didn't know I had those talents. I'd never been put in those situations before. And sometimes that's what brings it to light, right? Is when you're put in a situation and can you do something with the situation? Do you have the talent? And I really did. I was entrepreneurial. I was creative. I could go and get the musicians. I was organized. So I organized everything behind the scenes with my producer, uh, Charlie Palmer. And um, it was just such a wonderful experience, truly. Like I really was so sad when we had to stop doing it. And before we do get into leaving uh down home country which was the name of the tv show i want to talk mm -hmm. about during that time are you still performing are you still going out and uh performing at uh concerts or venues or candidate celebrations are you writing so take me through that process of what you were doing musically behind the scenes at that time um at that time i had started i had been writing in the 1990s and um, but had not actually recorded anything because I had it in my mind's eye that I would write whatever I wanted to write. And at some point later, I would find the right set of musicians and I would find a great producer. And then I would put an album out. I just wanted to wait more time. Like I wanted to have more experience before I put money into an album. So I wrote all through the 90s. And in 2001, when my son became extremely ill he's always been ill but this was a real turning point in his illness where it became way more difficult I had to step away from live performing and I had to make the decision you know like what was I going to do with myself because music was my career path 
So I just decided to continue writing. So I found a local studio in El Perot, Quebec, and, you know, uh, recorded demos, basically, the songs I had written, just so I had something documented, and uh, just kept writing. And it wasn't until 2015 where I actually performed again live at the Danes uh, uh, Country Picnic in Innisfil, Alberta. And that was with, like, big Dane stars like Dwayne Steele and other people shared the venue on different stages. And um, I don't have all the name list of names, but it was all, like, big-name people. And uh, I just did it because I could go in, do my job, and then go home. And that's the only way I can perform nowadays is, is it has to be a very fast, uh, quick situation because I can't be away from home. But, no. um, yeah, and then in 2016, I did the same thing. I went back to Danes and I performed there again. And I uh, did a longer show. I was singing as the main entertainer for a wedding. So it was like four hours of on and off singing, you know, through the ceremony and reception and all that stuff. I was the only person singing and I met, you know, other entertainers who were at the venue, like uh, Lacey J. Dalton and um, other Nashville artists that were there. And it was just such a, a wonderful experience. But like I said, I am a caregiver first to my son and my passion and my career have to kind of sit behind that, unfortunately. Um, but I still find a way to make it work. Um, and then I also was signed with an entertainment agency in Vancouver at the time. And I, my first job was working on the TV show Lucifer as a, back, a featured background um, actor. So lots of opportunities came and I took advantage of the ones I was able to basically in, in those years. So that's Let's... how that kind of played out. Let's talk about your music for a second before we continue on the path of after 2015 and 2016. Um, you, you, you yourself described a creative person, as you said at the beginning of the interview. Um, what comes first for you? Is it the lyrics or is it the actual tune of the song that you're sitting down to write? Um. Sometimes it's the lyrics and sometimes it's the lyrics and the melody. I don't play an instrument and the way that the songs come to me often is in my sleep. I will wake up with the song in my head and the lyrics on my, you know, on the, on the, on the end of my pen, so to speak. And it's like the universe demands that this song be written. <laughs> so I know it's a very bizarre way, but my entire career has been somewhat, you know, bizarre. So I just run with it. You know, when a song comes in and then what I do is I you know, try to find meaning personally, you know, from the song lyric or idea that comes in so that I can write it from a place of, yes, I've been there and experienced that or I know someone who has. And then it becomes like a global message for everybody eventually. So are that's you, how the songs come in. Are you your harshest critic when it comes to your songs? Do you continuously edit and try to make it better? Or do you just write and go, you know what, this is perfect. This is the way we want it. And then go to the studio, record, and then go from there. Or how does that process work? Because when I speak to musicians, uh, you, you get a range of people who say, you know what, I can sit, listen to a tune in my head, write it down, and it will be exactly the way I want it. Others say I have to write it for seven months before I get it correct. What what path are you in those two situations? Um, actually, neither. The way okay. that I work is I let the song come in, in its raw form, and then I will go through the first edit where I will, you know, make it a story that I can relate to because I can't sing something I can't relate to. Um, and in my case, all the stories right now are my personal story. So it's very easy to write that way. And I am editing basically right until the moment we are doing final recordings in the studio. I'm very flexible with songwriting. Nothing is cast in stone until we do our final, you know, uh, tracks in the studio and my final vocal in the studio. Everything is up for alteration. And I find that we get our best work doing that. Wow. Is to be flexible and just be in the creative process at all times. Because I work with very high level musicians from very well known bands. <laughs> so well, you know, I've learned a lot from them. And that's what I, I, I find so fascinating. The you have worked with and toured with some of the biggest names in Canadian country music. And 
you you seem so down to earth like talking to you right now is just it feels like we're just talking to a friend who i haven't talked to in about five years you seem so down to earth so how do you keep so down to earth because i've talked to uh, musicians where sometimes egos get in the way and they they are big but how do you stay grounded in that situation oh that's easy because i'm somebody's mom (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> best answer i've ever heard real? to that question yeah let's keep... <laughs> when you're somebody's mom i mean you're just mom at home you're not anybody special and i have found that that has kept me very grounded very real um i also am somebody that works from the heart and i call my music heart based because i relate to people from the heart and So that also keeps you very grounded, right? That you can talk to anybody. Um, I don't, you know, focus on what I've done and, you know, who I've been around. I'm grateful that I've been around everybody, but I don't think that it makes me really, excuse me, any different than anybody else. It's just my passion, right? Like I'm following my passion and my passion doesn't make me better than anyone. It's just what I like doing. So, you know, I'm still the person I, I always was just a regular person. You, you so when just people mentioned, come up and talk to me, yeah. You just, just mentioned something. Hi, that, you know? Yeah, I, you just mentioned something that I really want to jump on here. You said passion. This is your passion. Music is your passion. Do you consider it yeah. a career? Do you consider it a job mm-hmm. because you're still doing it, or do you consider it something that you're lucky enough to be able to do on a day to day basis to write music, produce, or create music for people to listen to? I am just so grateful and so very blessed with good fortune. Like I have been so lucky to be around the most amazing people who I look up to. I consider them, you know, people that make me better because I'm around them. You know, like they know how to play instruments. They've been in the industry for years. They know way more than I do. It's just that because I have certain talents and I can act on those talents, I kind of fit in. Right. Like I can sing and I can write and I'm good at business. So those talents mean that I bring something to my musicians and I offer it to them. And in a way that maybe they don't have those particular talents, they have other talents. So we work kind of as a homogenous group, right? Like everyone adding in their talents. And so that's, that's why I have such gratitude. I don't know everything. I trust my musicians to do what they do and they trust me to do what I do. That's kind of how it works. And that's why everybody is humble. You have been in the music industry for almost 30 years now. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first time hearing your own song on the radio at a local radio station? Or do you remember that moment? Um, Well, I heard little 30 second clips of me singing cover music back in the 90s, because that's all that radio was allowed to play, because I had no original music and you cannot play I'm sure, as, as you know, someone else's material without paying royalties. So I, when I heard my, my songs that I've written on the radio for the first time, it was this past, uh, it was December 31st of uh, coming into 2021, like going, leaving 2020 into 21, like kind of at the stroke of midnight was when I heard my first original song being played in Scotland on Radio 6 International. And I just in sat Scotland? There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. my songs are playing all over the world. So, and, and now this is a story I got to tell you because this is you're going to relate to. Do you remember the a wonderful recording artist Keith Hampshire? He was the first person that recorded the song uh, "The First Cut Is the Deepest." Yep. Okay, so through his friend, you know, like a uh, thing uh, on Facebook, like I friend requested him, and I just happened to notice that he had a DJ on his friend list. It was like visible on his front page. So I clicked on that DJ and he was from radio six international in Scotland. And, uh, so the guy asked me, well, why did your friend request me? And I just said, well, his name is Tony. And I said to Tony, well, I, uh, you know, I'm just trying to find out how to get my first song on the radio. And I said, I just thought if I maybe talk to a DJ that maybe they would tell me how it works. And he said, oh, he said, I can do better than that. He said, I want your song. You're not done here yet. And I want to put it on my radio. And I said, well, that song is still in pre-production. What you heard was a demo on Reverb Nation. 
And he says, well, can I play something else? And I said, well, can I send you another song? And he said, sure. So the song that actually played first on Scotland radio was my song, Husband John. And Tony Curry just said to me, as soon as you have You're Not Done Here Yet, I want that song for my station. And so what happened was I had no idea, but this was like mainstream radio. Like my song, Husband John, got onto a 10-week daily playlist quite by a by accident oh, wow. <laughs> just because i just because i picked the right dj to, to ask the question to <laughs> you so seem to have happen. the best luck in the like the music industry like your I'm whole super career, lucky. your whole career has basically <laughs> been like i'm not trying like not trying to down, downgrade anything you've done in your career but you are getting break after break here and just like the yeah. forethought to message someone on facebook who could yeah. be a potential DJ in Scotland of all places. <laughs> Scotland. <Yeah. laughs> like, I just took a chance. Like I said, open door, open thought, you know, and you just go for it. Okay. But I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question. I'm not trying to like, like d- diminish anything that you've done with all the good. You had to have some moments where people have said no to you, right? A lot. There oh, you go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Because, Let me tell you a funny story. I got to okay. tell you this funny story. When I was actually performing live a lot in the 90s, um, a friend of mine said to me, you should go to Toronto and do some vocal training with this. She is the top vocal trainer in Toronto. Her name is Diana Yampolsky, and she will just bring you to the upper level of you know vocal ability. So I did. I went to visit this lady in Toronto, and she told me, you don't have the talent for a music career. And I said, well, thank you very much. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I and I had paid a lot of money to go see her, but she just told me, no, nope, you don't have the talent. You do not have what it takes to be a singer at the upper level of the industry and stop wasting my time. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I wasn't insulted. It was just her opinion, right? It was like, whatever. True that. I mean, I knew I knew she was wrong, so I didn't argue, right? It was just like, okay. <laughs> But so that person was extremely like right in my face. You don't have the talent, but I've had lots of other people kind of, um, you know, stick their foot out to trip you up. You know what I mean? Uh, Kind of thing where it's done behind, you know, the scenes or, you know, situations that are negative, like being, uh, you know, people yelling at you while you're performing on stage and heckling and being unpleasant and all kinds of you know, people turning off monitors when you're on a big stage so you can't hear your music. And I've had that, like a lot of that type of stuff happen, which my TV producer just said to me, you know, you're doing well when people are trying to stop you from doing stuff. So just keep carry on. Amen (laughs) to that sister. Amen. (laughs) I couldn't agree more. Um, I just have a sense of humor about it. It's like everyone is allowed an opinion, even if it means they, they think I totally suck. That's okay. I don't mind because so, there's lots who don't think I suck. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I'm one of them. I can tell you that because we're about to get into the part where I'm going to ask you a few questions about some songs. So let's talk about okay. that husband, husband, John song that is top 10 in uh, Scotland right now on radio six. <laughs> <laughs> um, so husband, John, yeah. I'm assuming is based off of your husband that passed away in the early nineties. Yeah. 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 And this was, you know how most country songs are whiny? Like, I, I uh, you know, I lost my dog, you know, my she took my truck, all that kind yep. of stuff. Well, that is not my style of, of, you know, I might have sang that stuff in the past when I was doing cover music, but that is not my style as a writer and singer. So even though the story is a true story about my husband's uh, situation, and as I said, like, you know, it's in the past. I have no anger about it but I did want to write about it in a humorous way and the reason I wanted to is because I wanted to offer the listeners a different way to move through problems because that's the way I think is when something is really terrible there is one door that you can find in any terrible situation that can bring you out of the situation a better person so in my particular case when I found out about the infidelity I chose to be humorous about it and just go, this is so painful and so awful. It has to be funny because that's the only way I can process this and move forward is to 
to find some way to make this funny. So the way I wrote the song is the way I actually dealt with it, which is with humor. There's nothing you can do if somebody's finished with you, right? There is nothing. If they found someone else, the only thing that you can do is go have a good life. (laughs) Go on, pack your bags and get out. Because otherwise, you're just making yourself suffer more than you're already suffering. And so that basically, Husband John is my, my kind of rendition of the moment I realized the marriage was over. Um, I just told him, you know, take your stuff and get out. And I also realized that I needed to stop defining myself as a woman by a marriage, that I needed to start defining myself in my own terms as an individual human being. So it was actually a moment of great empowerment for me. And so I wrote the song more as a female power anthem, you know, like take, take your power back. Yep. Things can happen. It can be terrible. It's very sad. But you can still pick things up and and make it a powerful statement in your life. So that's what I did. And now the song is a very popular song. And and it speaks to a lot of people. They they don't even know why, I think, in a lot of cases. Wow. But I think it's because it's not a whiny, he done me wrong song. It's an empowered female anthem. That's what it is. So, And that was the way I experienced it. That's the way I moved through that real life situation. I just said to him, have a good life go be happy and I'm going to move on and figure myself out. (laughs) So I did. (laughs) That's the, that story is such a unique story when it comes to country music, because like you said, it's so country music is so often described as the, uh, like you said, my dog ran away, my truck got stolen, my (laughs) wife left me. And to hear someone say, you know what, I'm not going to write that way. I'm going to write it as, you know what, my husband cheated on me and I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm going to make the best out of it. So like, I, I give you credit for flipping the, uh, the equation of country music on its head and making it something different and making it your own. So like props to you. Um, the last, the last song I want to talk about here before we start wrapping up, because we just were in that like almost 40 minute range here. And I want to make sure we get everything in is because this is coming out in May for country music month. Um, you just recently released a new song, which I will openly admit I'm 90% sure I've been like listening to it on repeat for the last week and a half, (laughs) almost two weeks since we first started talking, but it's, you're not done here yet. I don't know how you've done it. You have me humming that song. You have me like, like singing along to the lyrics. So where does this song come from? Because it is amazing. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, Firstly, it's amazing because my producer Ray Roper, who is formerly from the band Stonebolt, is on the project. I mean, he and I really talked a lot about what I wanted this song to become because I brought a demo to him of the song. And I said, I want it to be like what you heard. I want it to be powerful and moving and emotional. So, you know, we also hired in Gary Lalonde from Honeymoon Suite. And, um, you know, between the three of us, and, um, you know, the other players who weren't as, as like instrumental in the conversation, but they were players, um, we all agreed that the song needed to musically be very powerful so that I could vocally get out the story that I wanted to get out. So from a global uh, explanation of this song, it's a song about hope. It's a song about love during times of extreme crisis, right? That, that something terrible happens in everyone's life at least once. And the only way to move through it is is hope and having connection. So the story on the global level is about that. On the personal level, it's about uh, my husband and I before he died. You know, I I used a car accident as the storyboard because I thought most people could relate to that subject matter. But really, it was a, a conversation about me saying to him, please don't leave. You know, you have a child who needs you when we knew that he was not going to live, you know what I mean? Like when I suspected, you know, that he was suicidal because that is how he died. And I just said, please don't do this. Please don't go. You have a little tiny boy who needs you. So that is what you're not done here yet is about. Even though it's written about a car accident, it's actually about just asking people to stay because they're loved and they're needed. And there's a place here in the world. 
So that probably is why you connected to the song because there's something inside of you that it called or speak it spoke to, right? Uh, Even though like uh, I put I yeah I put my personal story into it, but it's global. It really is for everybody. As uh, someone who lost a fiance to a drunk driver in a car accident, I now know officially why it's connected to me so well, and it didn't hit me until yeah. you just mentioned that. So mm-hmm. I like wow, <laughs> like. And I'm very sorry for your loss because, I mean, it's it's heart-wrenching to lose somebody that you care for, love, or have loved in the past. Like, it's just hard to lose people, really. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> now you got me all uh, flustered but here. That's because... why, yeah, but that's why it spoke to you because it was meant to go to the heart of the listener and it offers healing too, right? Like, yeah. we're never without hope if we love. So, you know, even in memory of the person, if you love, there's still the hope is alive for the person. So even if they didn't survive, and in my case, he didn't, but, um, you know, we have to at least try. We have to reach out. We have to talk to people and say, you aren't done here yet. We, somebody needs you. We need you. I need you. And that's really what the song is about. And I believe that, you know, the musicians and I succeeded in our goal because like so many people have come forward with me, you know, to me and just said, this song, I just can't, it's just like, I can't stop listening. And I said, because it means something to you personally. There's a personal story of yours in that song. And that was what we wanted. Well, I almost made it, it, I almost made it two seasons without crying on the uh, podcast. So congratulations, (laughs) SB, (laughs) you have, you have broken the tap of crying on the podcast. So (laughs) I'm sorry. Hey, no. Exactly. You needed to heal. That and, is, and that's what the song is about. And that's the great thing about music. I find music can connect with connect people to such an emotional depth and such an emotional feeling that they don't realize it until you talk to mm-hmm. someone about it. Right. So. Yeah. <clears throat> and, yeah. And because I've suffered greatly, I understand when someone else is suffering. Yeah. Like that's that heart to heart connection. I'm talking about the heart based music because you have to be there as a as a writer and a musician and a singer. If you're not operating from your heart, I'm not really sure how much people can relate to your music, right? It has to have something that speaks to the individual. Well, otherwise, it's just noise, you know, coming out of the radio. I would highly rec- recommend all my listeners go to wherever you get your music and listen to the song. It's greatly like it's an amazing song, well put together. And as you've just heard from SB herself, it has a meaning that I think everyone can find something in. Um, so that's mm-hmm. you're not done here yet. Uh, yet again, listen to it. I highly recommend it. Before I let yeah, you go, so S- oh, go ahead. I was going to say it's, it's on all major streaming platforms and it was number one three weeks after its release in Carlo, Ireland. Ireland and Scotland. You are. You're a... Yeah, my radio. Yeah, I was going to say I'm on the radio all over Ireland, Scotland, England, Belgium, Australia, Canada, U.S., all over the place. Well, there you go. Uh, for some reason, yeah. we have a very big following down in Australia. So to all my Australian listeners, please. Go to this, go to wherever you get your music and download it, all the major platforms. Um, before I let you go, though, we'll wrap up here. SB, what's next? Well, I have a whole long list of songs in pre production. Um, and this is a pretty exciting uh, announcement. My next song is a song I wrote for my son when he was a little boy. It's called Spencer's Song Slash In Your Father's Eyes. It's a ballad. And because the song is so touching and moving, it's about a conversation I had with my son telling him how important he was in his father's life. I hired um, like all my regular musicians, Ray Roper as a musician and my producer, Gary Lalone from Honeymoon Suite. And I hired Jimmy Mattingly from Garth Brooks. Oh, band, wow. And I hired John Heinrich from Ronnie Millsap's band because I wanted this song to match the emotionality of the storyline. So this song is going to be so exciting to release to the world because I hope everybody loves it. But that's the next single that's coming out from my EP that's in the works. And uh, I'm just very excited about that. And like I have probably two or three EPs that will eventually become an album over time, as well as Christmas music and other things I'm working on. So 
Lots when can we expect Spencer's song to drop? I am hoping by May, sometime in May. Uh, we're still, like, I have to go and redo final vocals. And uh, and then it goes into all the other production stages. But uh, the music is all ready. And, uh, yeah, so... But it takes a while for it to hit the major platforms, like when you submit it for just dist- global just dist- distribution. So I'm going to say safely, probably by the end of May, maybe mid-May. Well, it's perfect. Perfect time for Country Music Month on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Yeah. Perfect. SB, um, for my listeners who are still uh, tuned in, uh, the show notes to SB's website, her social media platforms are in the show notes. Please visit like her uh, follower. It's highly recommended. Um, SB, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It was a great pleasure, Chris. Thank you for having me. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Bye-bye.